last month was pretty spiritual intensive. So for September, I kind of want to focus a little more on our tutorials. That's right, it's all about balance on this channel. <laughs> Unlike what you've come to expect of this series so far, this isn't actually the hardest style study that I've ever done. There is a lot to learn, but it is similar enough to my own style that I feel confident about how this video is going to turn out. That being said, today's video is going to be a style study where we will cover one of my all-time fave artists, Sarah Tepes. Or oh, Tepes. Oh, I hope I'm saying that right. If I'm not, please don't come for me. As with all the other artists that I've covered on this series, if you've been anywhere on the internet, you've likely come across some of Sarah's art. And I am super, super excited to jump into this style study because I love her aesthetic. If you're new to this series on my channel, the way I structure my style studies is in three parts. In part one, we will analyze Sarah's style and look at what we can learn from it. Part two will be a study of one of Sarah's own paintings. The reference I chose is this one. And in part three, we will apply everything that we've learned in parts one and two to an original painting of our own. If you're as excited as I am to jump into this style study, then make sure to leave me a big thumbs up and hit that subscribe button down below so you don't miss the other art tutorials coming out this month. But with all of that said, let us now jump into another style study featuring Sarah Tempest. Right, hope you're mentally prepared for some memes, because let's face it, these videos eventually devolve into memes. <laughs> Sarah Tepes is a 21-year-old American illustrator who, according to her website, is currently in University for Graphic Design, Studio Arts and Photography in Virginia. Thankfully, her identity isn't a huge mystery, and Sarah is often very open with sharing personal posts and the occasional selfie on her Instagram. Is it unprofessional of me to say that I really freaking love her hair? Because I do. Fun random fact, I did some digging and found out that Sarah is actually ambidextrous. She writes with her right hand but draws with her left hand. We're basically almost twins, I'm just saying. <laughs> Her beautiful illustrations and dynamic portraits have garnered her over 289,000 followers on Instagram. Here on YouTube, Sarah shares mainly art tutorials, but also some meaningful tips about how to be a better artist and how to approach painting with a better mindset. Can you tell why I love her so much? <laughs> her YouTube channel has over 378,000 subscribers and is rapidly growing, which rightfully so. As you've seen with all the previous artists that we've looked at, Sarah is also incredibly partial to painting women. And as I've mentioned before, this is usually because female character art is generally more popular, though I'm sure Sarah has her own reasons to paint women, as do most artists. On the whole, Sarah's art can be described as highly stylized portraits that are almost reminiscent of watercolor paintings, but with a lot more sharpness. She generally paints digitally, though she does share pencil sketches and traditional watercolor art over on her Instagram. But all in all, her art can very much be categorized as illustrations as opposed to concept art or matte painting. However, Sarah has a very unique style that, honestly, I have never seen anyone else paint, ever. And trust me, I've looked. And that is what makes this style study so special, is because there is literally no other artist that paints like Sarah Tepes does. Uh oh, time for a pop quiz. What do you get when you cross the Roman numeral for 50 with the abbreviation for Indian Standard Time? Here are four key elements that characterize Sarah's art. 
The uniqueness of Sarah's portrait starts right from the very proportions she uses for her character's heads. So to begin with, let's look at the basic structure of some skulls. Here's a regular female human head. If I were to draw over this photo to guesstimate what her skull looks like, here's what we would end up with. Now, as an example, let's look at one of Ross Trang's portraits. He draws highly stylized female portraits too, so this would be a great frame of reference. So here's the second skull. As you can tell, there are some serious differences. The eyes are way larger, the nose is way smaller, and the jaw is narrower with a pointy chin. Now that we have those, let's look at one of Sarah's portraits. This one's head on, so it works for us. Now here, you'll see that the eyes are way farther apart, but also they are set quite high up on the face. Generally, artists like to set the eyes quite low on the face to make the face look cuter, but Sarah doesn't rely on this. You'll also notice that the nose and lips aren't minimized, unlike in most stylized portraits. The lips are generally glossy and darker than the skin, and while the jaw and chin are fairly understated, they aren't completely rounded off. You still see a jawline, and the chin isn't super pointy either. But the biggest feature that Sarah uses so effortlessly is the cheekbones. The cheekbones on pretty much all of Sarah's characters are fairly high and very pronounced. Bear this in mind for now, we'll come back to it a little later. The characters have fairly realistic bodies which are neither hypersexualized nor minimized, just fairly neutral bodies if a little thin. The one thing I did notice is that their necks are generally extremely thin. Again, keep this in mind, it will become relevant later, but the overall focus is on the character's eyes. The eyes are really the only features that are truly very different from a realistic head. Now, if you look at Sarah's portraits, you'll notice that there is a lot of drama, but there aren't even that many dramatic elements. Like here, for instance, it is a very emotive portrait, but there isn't really any specific element or background detail that makes it so dramatic. So how does she create so much theatre without the actual props? This is where the shadows come in. You see, the way Sarah places the shadows on the face is, in my opinion, what makes her art so unique. While in previous style studies we've seen that artists tend to really minimize, soften and even completely get rid of any shadows on the skin, Sarah goes the other way and actually uses very strategic, heavy shadows to subtly create drama in her work. She almost uses strong shadows to sculpt the face in a way. They are placed specifically in certain areas so as to almost create an illusion that the bone structure is showing through the skin. You'll notice prominent shadows under the cheekbones which serve to make them appear even higher than they already are. The area on both sides of the nose is fairly flat, so the contrast between this flat area and the shadows on the outside of the face again accentuate the cheekbones. This is further held with a shadow right at the bulb of the nose, which increases the contrast, making the area under the eye appear even flatter. The forehead is often pretty flat with few shadows. If you notice, this creates an almost inverted triangle of light on the face. While the head itself isn't necessarily triangular, the placement of light and shadows creates an illusion of the jaw being narrower. As a result, the forehead appears way wider than the chin and it creates an inverted triangle. In fact, when you add in the unrealistically skinny neck, this further accentuates that triangular effect, making the bottom of the face look even narrower. But why would she do that? Well, if you look at basic shape language, there are three main shapes that make up everything. Anything that is rounded and circular, we tend to perceive as soft and friendly. Anything that is square or rectangular, we see as reliable and sturdy. But triangles, oh, triangles are that fun, crazy, rich aunt that gives you beer in the swimming pool when your mum isn't looking. You see, triangles often depict dynamism. They are the symbol of movement. 
Think about it, you see a triangle, you automatically see an arrow. Triangles are all about movement and speed. So when Sarah creates an overall triangular shape in her portraits, what does this do for us? Well, remember how I said these portraits can have no background elements but still look so dramatic? Well, the subtle triangles work to add loads of movement without you even consciously realizing it. Boom. Theatre without the props. Alright, the rest of this list isn't going to be too lengthy, hopefully. <laughs> Let's quickly look at the colour palette that Sarah tends towards. Now, while she has some amazing portraits with extremely unnatural vivid lighting, in general, Sarah opts for very neutral skin, but with a few bold accents. These accents could be bright, highly saturated colour, but more often than not, they are accents of dark elements. These accents often frame the character's face, which, as you can guess, serves to drive your attention back to the focal point, which is the eyes. But the one thing you'll notice is that no matter what the lighting setup is, the way Sarah paints the skin is actually very dependent on the storyline. Here's what I mean. Here are some examples of dramatic lighting and how they impact the skin tones. You'll notice that thanks to the ambient light, the skin colour usually picks up the ambient colour. So if there is a strong red light, the skin glows red. If there is a blue light, it appears blue. And in some of the more recent portraits that Sarah has painted, you'll see this effect. Here, the background is a crucial part of the story. I'd even go far as to say that the character isn't the main focus, or rather the only main focus of this painting. But in pieces where the character is the main focus of the painting, you'll notice that she paints the skin in the colours of, well, skin. So here, even though the background is bright red and blue, the skin is a neutral skin tone. Here, where the background is a strong saturated yellow, the skin is skin toned. This has the effect of shifting the focus yet again in a very subtle way. See? You didn't notice it before, did you? Sarah does make some other effective colour choices too. The blush is usually quite dark and is placed quite high up on the nose and the cheeks. The lips are usually darker, slightly more saturated than the skin, and my favourite part of all, she actually leaves her brush strokes in. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Brush strokes are generally visible in the shadowy areas, which gives them a lot of texture. But in the flatter areas of the face, in the inverted triangle of light, everything is super smooth and well blended. And yet again, this serves to further flatten the center of the face while making the outer edges a lot more sculpted. It's the little things, man. And finally, let's talk about the character's hair. I decided to give this its own point on the list because this seems to be such a massive part of Sarah's portraits, and rightfully so. We often don't realise it, but a character's hair has a huge impact on their personality. I'm not just talking about the colour and the cut, but also the overall silhouette of the hair. You see, in design terms, hair and fabric are the two quickest way to add movement and rhythm to a painting. The way a character's hair is styled, the way it flows, and the shapes that it creates can have a massive impact on how they are perceived. In most of Sarah's art, the characters have quite fluid, dynamic hair, regardless of length and texture. You'll see that longer hair flows gracefully, while shorter hair is more edgy with loads of movement. The curly styles often have a light, fluffy quality. Those circles, they really add a ton of softness. And all of the hair frames the face. There is often a very clear distinction between the hair and the skin, and 9 times out of 10, the hair is shaped so that it makes the top of the head seem wider than the base of it. But I'm not just talking about the hair on the character's skull. You see, one key characteristic that you didn't even notice is that Sarah gives her characters quite prominent eyebrows. 
And more often than not, the eyelashes are painted to be longer on the outside of the eye and usually not even visible on the inside of the eye. This creates that doe-eyed look because the eyes themselves are so big and round, the lashes and brows almost serve to temper them. But this combination of thick brows and sharp cheekbones, which are traditionally masculine characteristics, along with the fluttery lashes and soft lips, this combo serves to create a very androgynous look. And that, my friends, is why Sarah's art is so different to most other stylistic portraits. While many other artists focus on enhancing the femininity of the female characters and conversely the masculinity of the male characters, Sarah once again goes the opposite way, creating a blend of both traditional characteristics to create more jarring, unexpected and very iconic portraits. So to summarize the analysis portion of this video, Sarah's art can be broken down into these four main characteristics. 1. The proportions. While they're not too crazy different from the realistic human face, they place a huge emphasis on the character's eyes. 2. The shadows are placed carefully and strategically in order to add tons of movement to an otherwise static portrait. Number 3. The colour palette is generally quite neutral with accents of colour or darkness, but the skin colour often varies based on the story rather than the ambient light. And number 4. The hair story is actually way more important than we would think, and the eyebrows add to a more androgynous appearance. Alright, so for part two, we're going to do a quick study of one of Sarah's paintings. The reference I chose was this portrait of one of Sarah's own original characters called Madeline Pinkberry. I figured that the painting was simple enough that it would make for a quick study, but it was complex enough that we would actually learn something from painting it. What I didn't anticipate was just how tough it would be to paint those eyes. Through this time lapse, you'll see me consistently having to go back and repaint the eyes because there was a strange shape to them. Not only was it quite hard for me, a fairly realistic painter, to draw them so much larger and farther apart than I'm used to, but the very shape of the upper eyelid had me stumped for entirely too long. You see, while the waterline and the lower eyelid are rather round, the top lid has almost this mountainy shape. As far as I can tell, this was just in this specific painting, so I'm guessing it wasn't super intentional, but I mention it because it stumped me. Why? No idea. But my brain was just refusing to comprehend that specific shape on that day. As far as rendering is concerned, like we spoke about earlier, the center of the face and all the highlighted areas are very soft and very well blended. So for those areas, I used a translucent soft airbrush layer. If you watch the Shell E style study, you know how this works. But as it turned out, the shadowy areas were way more sketchy than I anticipated. And you know your girl loves some brush strokes, so my little soul was singing. <laughs> Here's what I ended up with. Pretty pleased with how it came out. I think it turned out very, very close to the original. Okay, so with this one, I kind of want to run a bit of an experiment with you guys. Just a theory I'm testing out, which is to do with energy work. If you're not interested, feel free to ignore the next bit of voiceover. But for those of you who are down for a bit of fun, I kind of want to try stamping this particular painting with an intention for those of you who are into that kind of energy work. So I'm intending that, should you be open to it, that watching this painting process will get you some free ice cream in the next couple of days. I know, it's a little strange, but I'll explain it all later. If you're open to it, I'm setting the energetic intention that, over the next few days from you watching this video, you somehow get some free ice cream. All you gotta do is be open to the intention and invite it into your life. And if it works, I'd love for you to come tell me as a comment here or over on my social media. 
I'm just trying to play with some manifestation ideas, so I figured I'd rope you guys in on it as well. It's nothing to do with subliminals or anything, and nor is it some kind of witchcraft thing. I don't know enough about witchcraft to actually use it. But yeah, if you want to play along, I want you to invite a free ice cream into your life. Okay, so today's original painting is just a simple portrait in the style of Sarah Tepes. I've been calling her Sarah Tepes this whole time. I don't even know if Tepes is the way to say it, but I hope it is. If not, I'm going to look very, very stupid. Anyway, I made sure to use all four characteristics from part one in this painting, as well as the soft airbrush layer we looked at in part two. And I actually really love the vibe of how it turned out. As with every video, if you like this art and would like to support the channel, you can grab some downloads over on Patreon. Link is in the description. In fact, I'm trying to program it so that having an image of this painting will draw your free ice cream in even quicker. So if you like, you can totally screenshot this video and forget about it, or grab the original over on Patreon. So there we go, Sarah Tepes, demystified. I hope you've enjoyed this video and found it helpful. I know I have. Let me know in the comments below if you're joining the ice cream experiment. I kind of want to see how it turns out. So let me know in the comment down below because I'm trying to see something. Okay? Okay. <laughs> If you're new to this series, then make sure to check out my other style study videos. I will leave a playlist up here. Um, they're all super helpful and they're all super entertaining and you will learn a lot from every single one of them. So I highly recommend you check out the style study playlist up here. Hit that subscribe button down below. Come find me on social media, you know the drill. But with all of that said, I thank you so much for hanging out with me today. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. And I will see you guys on the next one. Bye.